Hey, good morning, Third Coast. Good morning. My name is Zach, for those of you that don't know me. I'm the worship director here. Um, and this music video is brought to you by your experience walking to the door, so upside in the way. <laughs> we like to have fun in that way. Usually when people say that they like to have fun, they're just trying to look like they like to have fun, not really what we actually do. So, uh, so if you guys would just join me in a word of prayer, um, we're here to worship Jesus. He's so good, um, and he deserves it. So uh, would you pray with me? God, we love you so much. Thank you for getting us here safely. Um, thank you for the warmer weather. It's uh, really, really lovely. Um, thank you for this morning. <clears throat> I pray that in this time we'd be able to experience your heart for us, that we would have a clear picture of how you feel towards us, and that we would respond effectively. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's say that.
molten word. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. At this time, we're going to invite the lecture forward, continue worshiping with our tithes and our offerings, and you get to watch the cool thing. Something worth talking about. I think it's great. 
put strain on, on different parts of the uh, of the organization. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about how this ties into to Kevin's message last week? Yeah, so your was last week, Kevin kind of went through this handouts in the back and a couple other things, which talks about how we as a group of churches we exist to make more disciples, develop more leaders, and plant more churches throughout West Michigan. And we're kind of bent on world domination. Like, we want everybody in the world to know that Jesus loves them and has a full life for them. And, and it's not about forcing our agendas or our views or anything. It's about inviting everybody in the world into the family of God, right? And, and doing everything we can through this posture of mission to introduce everyone to the goodness of Jesus. And so Kevin talks about how, you know, that, that, that means sometimes we have to get out of our comfort zones. That means we have to give sacrificially. We have to live sacrificially. And so as we kind of move into this, this space as a church where, you know, it's cranked in back after service and there's, there's not enough space for kids, we're, we're kind of facing this reality. This isn't always a comfortable space for guests to find where they belong in Jesus. And so if you want to continue being that open door, everybody's welcome. This is a safe place to kick the tires on faith and to ask big questions and belong before you believe, then, then we need to kind of um, address our space issues. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what you want to say? I think so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we talk about the future, I'm going to jump back to the past a little bit. So probably about, I don't know, it was four to six months ago. So yeah. I got up and talked about uh, that Third Coast uh, had been uh, helped by the network at Ridgepoint pursuing getting a portable classroom we were going to put outside. So we got a, a, an initial pot of money approved for that. That was, I would say, it was five figures. And then we got into the process of meeting with our ministry leaders and our kids team and kind of what is this thing really going to look like. And uh, the classroom got bigger and the budget got bigger. And graciously, the network continued to just open their arms up and say, Third Coast, if this is what you need, we will give that to you. It got to the point where we were into six figures spent to get this portable classroom done. And then a little bit of that was the size of the classroom. A little bit of it was that we, when we talked to the township, they, uh, because of the, the length of time this classroom was going to be on the camp, they wanted it to be a little bit more permanent. So we were getting into basically building a building right next to this building. And it really came down to a question of stewardship. Like, are we as a small church that, um, that operates on a very conservative fiscal uh, uh, policy, is this the right thing to do, or is there something else that we can be doing? And we pray about it, and we, and we really do, even in this kind of practical matter, feel like the Holy Spirit came in and said, why don't we just make sure that this is the right thing we want to do? So that's where uh, starting to use Hemlock for the kids came from, uh, starting to kind of redo how we're setting up service. And we're now in this position of, if we're going to move forward, we want to make sure we're doing it in the context of a bigger vision, especially if we're going to spend something like uh, like what we were about to spend back in the end. <coughs> so how does that tie in? What are we maybe we looking for from, from this group? So we're going to make some decisions, and we want to include you in the conversation. So next uh, Sunday at uh, 4 o'clock, we're canceling Life Group 101. I crossed it off on my program. <laughs> Right. We're canceling that, and we're going to gather here at 4 o'clock to talk about this, talk about our space issues and possible solutions, and are we getting a portable classroom, or are we adding services, or freak out, you know, and if we do, what does that mean? And so um, we're going to pray about it this week, and we're going to come up with some possible solutions, and we want to include you in the conversation. Before we make a decision, hey, this is what we're going to do to solve this problem, we want um, to cast vision a little bit and help you understand the tensions we're navigating, update you on kind of uh, some of the things going on. So next Sunday at 4 o'clock, come join us, and we're going to talk more about this. And it's kind of, you know, as we started to solve problems and come up with solutions last week, one of our shepherding elders said, hey, we need to include everybody. Let's, let's include everybody. So you're welcome next Sunday at 4 o'clock to meet here with us. We have another vision meeting. There might be some snacks. I'm not sure what they are, because I haven't got anybody to bring yet. <laughs> and last time I did this, we were mad, so it's a pie, and we had fun pie. But anyway, it's going to be Sunday at 4 o'clock when we talk about our vision and growth and what that means for us at the local church. Thank you. And not to labor that, but just, just make sure that everybody's included in that. So there are those of us that have practical gifts, and then those of us that have a gift of prayer. And those two things together are going to get us to find the right solution on this. So thank you so much. I think that's it. That's it. So if you're fourth grade and under and you're already signed in, you guys can stand up. And you can go back to the, the, youth, the children's ministry leaders, Angel and Hannah are back there. You guys can jump on the bus. Our kids go over to the dining hall for their time of worship. And then afterwards, they come back and you can check them out the back. And everybody else, feel free to stand up.
Hey, good morning, guys. Glad to have you with us today. Uh, my name's Aaron, I'm the pastor here. If we didn't say it, John is on our board of directors. That's why he's speaking so confidently and knowledgeable about money and vision. So that's uh, we're thankful for John and his leadership. Uh, John and another small group of people help keep me in line and keep our church on the tracks. Um, when I'm freaking out. See, we need to go to two services. And we're just like, hey, chill. Let's get everybody involved. So that was good. We're thankful for John and his leadership. Uh, we have been in this series called The End. Right, and uh, we took a break last week to have our senior pastor Kevin come in and talk about the vision for our whole family of churches. Um, how we are a group of people who just fearlessly make Jesus known. We invite all people into God's family, and and that fits really well into our series, The End, because as we talk about kind of this timeline of history and what the Bible reveals to us about the end of the world. Like, there's a very important message in there that time is limited, right? And our lives matter, and what we do in our lives matter. And so throughout this series, you know, we kind of, we talked about how, you know, God created everything in unity. He was with his people, and he had a plan and a purpose for reality, and the spiritual, the physical, was all one beautiful whole. But then when humanity rebelled, it kind of got split, right? And so we have these two kind of competing realities. We've got the kingdom of God, which kind of was separated from the kingdom of this world in the very beginning when man rebelled. And so throughout the series, we've just been looking at how God has pursued his people, right? He invited Israel to be the people that reconciled everybody back to right relationship with God. They tried, they failed, they tried, they failed, and God continued to pursue his people. And, and then we got to this point where Jesus comes, and Jesus says, the kingdom is among you. It's here. I brought it back. It's right here, right now. And so we have these two realities happening at the same time. In one reality, the present age, things are still broken. We still hurt. There's still pain. People are still separated from the right relationship with God, separated from the lives they were meant to live. But in this other reality, Jesus has conquered sin. He's paid the price for our rebellion. And he's invited us into bringing his kingdom down and impacting this world, right? Pulling the truth and power of heaven into the present reality of earth, if you will. And so we've been talking about what that means, you know? And, and a couple weeks ago, we talked about tribulation and how every generation throughout history has feels that pressure of these two kingdoms colliding, right? It's not a tension like they're pulling apart. It's a pressure like they're coming together. And eventually, they're going to come together so finally that all things will be made whole and right again. But in the meantime, there's this tribulation. There's this pressure. It's like labor pains before a new life, right? Before a baby's born, there's this pressure and this pain between what is and what will be. And that's what tribulation looks like. And two weeks ago, we talked about there will come a time when Jesus comes back. And all of us who have joined his family will be brought into his home forever, and those of us who have chosen not to will be separated for, from him forever. And so today we're ending the series by talking about that reality. What is it going to be like in the new heaven and the new earth? What is this hope of heaven? But before we get into that real quick, we would be negligent if we didn't talk about a couple other theological points. Now, this whole series has been in Matthew 24 and 25, and so you can just Crack your Bible now, read through that if you're bored, that's fine, no judgment. Um, but today we're going to move into Revelation. And Revelation is a book of the Bible. It was written by John while he was in prison on an island called Patmos. Interestingly, my wife worked at a youth camp called Patmos. It was on an island in Ohio. I'm like, why do they name it after a prison camp? It's just not a good idea. Anyway, so John's on this island, and the Holy Spirit comes to him and gives him this revelation. And, and he, he records it, and he puts it in a letter to the churches. And in the book of Revelation, this is God, this is Jesus speaking directly to his people. So throughout the series so far, we've looked at texts specifically from Jesus' prophecy about the end time. Today we're going to look at a text uh, from Revelation, from John hearing the voice of Jesus and, and, in, and talking about what it will be like in the end time. So before we dig into that, though, there is this part in Revelation where it talks about what's going to happen before Jesus sets up the new heaven and the new earth. In Revelation 20, it talks about this period of time called the millennium. Okay? Now, a couple weeks ago, we talked about the tribulation and how that might be general tribulation for every generation, all those, or it might be the seven years of specific tribulation that we're raptured up out of. Either way you fall on that, 
it doesn't change how you follow Jesus or what we believe about the end, okay? It's not a major point of theology. Now, when it comes to the millennium, in Revelation 20, it talks about this thousand years of reign of Jesus, this golden age where everything that God intended to be real is present in this physical world. And during that time, Satan's locked up, and at the end of that time, Satan's destroyed and all things are made new again. Now, until about a hundred years ago, people just assumed that was everything that happened between the time of Jesus and his second coming. Let's see what we have here. So like this, uh, this uh, post-millennialism, right? The millennium is just everything that happens until Jesus comes back in the yellow section here. And at his second coming, he makes his rule and his reign come in fullness. But about a hundred years ago, uh, something called World War I and World War II happened. And so this idea uh, of, well, maybe that's not exactly what's going on. Maybe there's another theology we can create to explain this. We, we kind of came up with post-tribulation millennialism, where there's going to be a time of pain and tribulation, and then Jesus is going to take over, and then he's going to come in fullness at the last judgment. That's the blue section at the top. And then some people are like, oh, that doesn't really line up with everything we want to believe, so we're going to do pre-tribulation. And then some people, you know, there's just another system saying that the second coming is going to come, that Jesus is going to take us all away from the tribulation. And then we're going to come back for the millennium. And then Jesus is going to judge everybody and destroy Satan. Then some people, in the green section, <laughs> say, you know, it's all symbolic. In the Greek terms, that, that a millennium is actually just 10 by 10 by 10, and it's the symbolism of foreverness, right? And so all millennials just believe that Jesus has reigned, kind of back to the original interpretation, Jesus has reigned since he came to when he comes again to bring the new heaven and the new earth. Now, when my dad used to explain this, he's like, I'm kind of an odd whateverist, because <laughs> it doesn't really matter which one of these you believe. The bottom line is there's going to be pressure. And then Jesus is still the king, and he's coming back someday to bring his kingdom in fullness. So that's what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about the truth that Jesus is coming. When he comes, he's going to, he's going to, there's going to be a judgment, right? Everyone's going to be standing before God the judge at this time, and we're all going to be found guilty. Good news. You don't hear that often in church, do you? Right? I, when I was young, I saw this little tract, Bible tract, and there's this guy standing in front of God. It's just big judge bench, and there's this movie projector and all the things he ever done was on the screen. I was like, oh, that's going to suck. Right? <laughs> <laughs> We're all going to have to watch everything bad we've ever done. And, and there is this idea that we're going to be judged, but the truth is none of us are going to be found innocent. We're just going to be found either under grace or not under grace. Because all people are invited into this family of God. And after that judgment, you're either going to be said, hey, your penalties have been paid for by the blood of Jesus because you accepted that gift you're in, or, or not. And then after that time, we are excited that the fullness of heaven and earth, the fullness of heaven will collide with earth and all things will be made new. So that's a lot of theology in a real quick minute. But it gets us to this point where we're ready to read through our text today. So let me pray for us, then we'll read through Revelation 21. And we'll jump into this topic of the new heaven and the new earth. Jesus, you're here with us. We believe you're alive. And you're speaking to us. So speak to us through your word today, through your scripture, through me. Silence everything that's not of your voice. And just help us to understand more who you are and what you're up to in the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. So, let me read Revelation 21, 1 through 5 for us. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God is, God's dwelling place is now among his people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated at the throne said, I am making all things new. So today we want to talk about this hope of heaven. 
this hope that God is going to make all things new. And I love that idea, right? I love the idea of newness. And it makes me think about the season we're in right now, right? Did anybody experience winter this past week? <laughs> Somebody in Florida who just got back last, like yesterday, we all hate you, don't raise your hand. <laughs> all right, but when I think about this, I think about this metaphor of winter, right? And we're all in the middle of this just heavy, cold, my three, my, my heater lines, when you go to oil, my lines froze, and my heater quit was so cold, right? And so we get this idea that the present age is like winter. Right, where things are cold and, and the, the clouds are covering the, the sun and we, we get to this point in January and February where we're like, just, come on, where is summer already, right? And when God says, I'm making all things new, it makes me think, oh, okay, spring's coming, summer's coming, the life that's been laying dormant under the snow is gonna break through and all things are gonna be made new again. That's what I think of when I think of heaven. The new heaven and new earth is that we're in this series, this kind of period of winter right now, and and we know summer's coming, but right now it just feels cold, it feels dark, and it doesn't feel like we're fully living life what we're meant to live. If you were to visit Michigan right now, you wouldn't buy a home here, right? You'd find another place to live because this isn't the fullness of the beauty that is our state. And so we're waiting for summer, and that's kind of the picture I get. Uh, uh, waiting for heaven, right? And it's, God says he's going to make all things new. Now, when we think about heaven, I grew up watching Looney Tunes, and uh, Elmer Fudd, every time he got killed by Bugs Bunny, he went up to heaven, and he strung the harp on a cloud, and he was dressed in a toga. It was fantastic. And I thought to myself, I do not want to go to heaven. <laughs> all right? Because in the Renaissance period, somebody painted a painting, and that's the idea people got of what heaven was going to be like. And I think a lot of us think that. Heaven's going to be clouds and harps. Let me tell you, Definitively, there is no biblical proof that there will be clouds, harps, or togas. Okay? You can, you can clap. That's good. That's awesome. Heaven is not going to be like that. Heaven's also not going to be sports cars and video games. When I was at summer camp and I asked my counselor what heaven was going to be like, he's just, he said it's all chocolate and meat, video games, and sports cars. And so, you know, fifth grade was like, sweet, I want to go to heaven. It's much better than clouds and harps. But it's not what heaven's going to be like. We kind of superimpose our values of what we want here and what we think we're going to want in heaven, right? There's this uh, Super Bowl commercial that I saw preached before. This guy's walking through the field of grain, and he's touching the grain. He comes up on this house, and there's his grandfather on the porch. He says, Grandpa? And he embraces him. We get this idea that like, he's in heaven now. He's reunited with his grandfather. And his grandfather says, hey, come with me. And they walk to the garage and he pulls his sheet off a brand new Audi. And he says, this is for you. And the man gets in and he grips the steering wheel. And then he like, his body convulses. He's like, what's going on? And it convulses again. And then he wakes up and a, a co-worker is giving him a behind look. And he's back in, in reality. He's just choking on a cashew. <laughs> so, spoiler alert. No spoiler. <laughs> But we, we get this idea that the things we want on earth are the things that we're going to want in heaven. And that's just not how it's going to be, right? Heaven is not uh, clouds and harps, and it's not the things we wish we had here. What heaven is, is this, this total restoration of everything God intended to be, right? In Genesis, there was a garden, and there was perfect balance and perfect unity, and we had everything we needed. And we get this idea in Revelation that all things will be restored to that order plus interest, right? When it talks about the new Jerusalem in verse 2, you can go to verse 2 up there if you want. Unless you don't want to, that's fine. Um, it talks about this capital city and, and how God's going to restore all unity and balance. And in this city, we get this idea, it's not like a dream, it's like the fullest form of reality that we could ever imagine. Where there is art and there's culture, and guys, I'm sorry, there's jobs though. Right? We're going to have roles to play. There's going to be creativity because you were created in the image of God to do stuff, but you're going to have jobs without the curse of work. You're going to do jobs and love it. You're going to have craft. There's going to be society, and there's going to be culture. And so God gets everything he wanted originally plus interest. It was a garden in the beginning in Genesis. And in Revelation, we get this picture of the new Jerusalem being a garden city, a place where all humanity is brought back to unity with God, and God dwells among them. And it's the mo most real reality that we can imagine. So it's not a fuzzy dream or a cloud or a new Audi. 
It's actually the fullness of what this world was meant to be, plus the interest of everybody throughout all of history who's believed in Jesus at this massive family reunion of this new heaven and this new earth in this garden city, the new Jerusalem. Everything being made right. So imagine everything about this world right now, minus the stuff you don't like, right? It's, it's this world that God created, minus the brokenness and the pain and the frustration and the miscommunication and what have you. It's a reality without steroids. It's like moving from black and white TV, I imagine. Moving from black and white TV to color TV and then to reality. When Jesus came, he's like, hey, look at this color TV. Right? You can live in black and white. The kingdom is among you. And we're like, oh, Jesus is awesome. Look at this color TV. But it's going to be like moving from color TV to moving to a live action reality of living with God in the world that he intended, where balance is restored, where summer has come in full, where winter is gone, and the life that was laying dormant under the snow has sprung forward with new colors that we've never seen with new fragrances that we've never smelled, with new uh, boats, no, not boats or RVs, but new awesome realities that we can't even imagine right now. That's what heaven's gonna be like. Now, why is this relevant to us today, right? I wanna to propose to you today that the hope of heaven, the, there is power in the promise of heaven. When we really set our hearts on this reality that Jesus is gonna come back and make everything new again, there's a power that comes with that. Right? When we imagine how things will be and we believe this promise of how they will be, we live our lives now in a different way. Right? When I was a young boy, I went to my uh, cousin's house for spring break. And he was really into airplanes. His dad was a pilot, so he had to be. But he also had this passion about airplanes. He had all these models in his room. I got to his house and cool, airplanes. That's awesome for you. And his mom said, hey, we're going to go to the Air Museum over spring break. I'm like, mm-hmm. That's what homeschool moms do. They take you to the Air Museum over spring break. <laughs> okay? And I was like, all right, whatever. He's in the airplanes. We're going to the Air Zoo. Not cool. And we get to the Air Zoo a couple days later. And my, my cousin has this little fire jet. Let me borrow. I'm kind of playing with it. Whatever. And we walk into the Air Zoo. And one of the first things we see is this massive fighter jet with the American flag painted on the side. I had never been more patriotic than I was in that moment. <laughs> As my little boy brain exploded, and I started to realize that this little toy that my cousin was into, there's a real version of this. And we got to walk up and we sit in the cockpit of this fighter jet. It blew my mind. That someday, maybe, and I'm not going to, but someday maybe I could fly one of these. So that people really flew these. And all of a sudden, Will be, it gives us a new understanding of how this life should be and could be, right? And so we start to live life differently. When Jesus was with us, he said, hey, when I leave, you're going to do everything I did. Plus, you're going to do even greater things. He gave us a power to pull the kingdom of God out of the you know, possible into our reality. He said, all authority has been given to you under heaven. So baptize people in my name, reconcile them to right relationship with me, and like heal people, and like cast out demons, and do amazing things. That's the power that we as followers of Jesus were meant to live with. We're meant to make all things new. It said in verse 5, I'm making all things new. But in the New Testament, we see clearly that Jesus says, I have come now to start forever now. I grew up thinking when I die, that's when forever starts, right? Jesus said, no, the kingdom's among you. Forever has started right now. When we come to new life in Christ, you start your forever journey into heaven. And so we get this idea that we're supposed to live with the hope of heaven in a way that brings God's power into this present age to restore what's broken. We are God's agents meant to bring heaven into earth in new and powerful ways. You know, a couple weeks ago, we prayed for Trevor. We prayed for his cancer. He's not with us this morning, is he? And um, we prayed with confidence 
And we pray knowing that God can heal him. And we pray with power because we understand that one day all things are going to be reconciled. And even now, God has said, you have the power to bring that. Now, what percentage of the people I pray for the healer are healed? Not a high percentage. But 100% of the people I don't pray for aren't healed. Right? I was watching some show, and I'm going to tell you what it was because I can't recommend it. But some Marine was like, it's not ours to wonder why, it's just ours to do or die. I'm like, as a Christian, God has said, bring my will into this world, bring my power into this world. And when it doesn't work, I don't explain why. That's up to God. What I know is that he wants his kingdom to break into earth. So we live our lives claiming his victory and praying for his hope and his healing all over the world bringing his kingdom wherever we can. The hope of heaven brings a power to our lives, knowing that God wants it to start now and then go on into eternity. I hope that makes sense, guys. <clears throat> so the next thing is there's also a peace in the promise of heaven. Because the truth is, no matter how hard I pray or how hard I work, there is brokenness in this world that I will not see healed this side of heaven, right? I had a funeral for a friend on Tuesday. She has struggled with um, uh, a type of cancer for three years. And they had prayed healing, they had prayed power, and they had claimed Jesus' healing. And they came to a point last week where she passed into the next life. And her family had a hard time dealing with that. And I grew up knowing heaven was real up until three years ago when my dad passed. I had to ask myself if I really believed that. And the promise of heaven brings a peace to this life because we really do believe that God will make all things right. It says in verse 1 there that there will be no more sea, right? Um, you might think to yourself, well, I love fishing. Why isn't there going to be a sea? It's not what it's talking about at all. In the Hebrew worldview, the sea or the water was where chaos was. The deep was where the monsters were. They didn't have scuba. They didn't have submarines. All right? They could not explain what was below the surface of the water. They couldn't chart it. They couldn't control it. And so the deeps, the sea, was seen as that one part of their world that they couldn't understand or control. If you went down there, you were gone. All right? It's like our kind of, we think that about space. They didn't know space was a thing. Right? So that's what it's talking about. That one day, there will be no more chaos. There will be no more monsters. There will be no more uncharted territory. God will remove that from our world, and it will be total victory. No matter how much heaven breaks into earth, there's still death. But in the new heaven and new earth, the sea will be removed, chaos will be removed, death will be removed, the monsters will be removed, and all the goodness of God will reign with his people, and all suffering will give way to restoration. Like we see in verse 4 there, let's push for a second. Boop. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. That's the hope of heaven that gives me peace even when I don't understand why things go how they go here on earth. And the last thing is that there's a purpose in the promise of heaven. This time right now has purpose. When we understand that we are built for heaven, we understand that right now we have things to do. In verse 2, it talks about how this is a time of preparation. Because on that day when Jesus comes back, he's coming for his bride. He's coming to reunite in fullness with his church. When Emily and I got engaged, I didn't stop talking to her. How long were you engaged? Seven months. Seven months. It would really stink like she didn't talk to her the whole time, right? You're engaged to Jesus right now. You're in this period of preparation, of getting to know him, of preparing for forever. And it is right and it is good for you to build a relationship with this living God so that when you are reunited, the fullness of what that relationship was intended to be will come. Right? And so we're in this period of preparation, like a bride getting ready for their wedding. You don't stop talking to the person you're engaged to. And incidentally, if you're doing that, that's a bad idea. Okay? Or if you know somebody doing that, that's a bad idea. This is the time to get to know the other. Verse 3 says, you know, it's, it's like, there's this communal aspect to it, too. What's verse 3 say? And then I heard the Lord, loud voice from the throne saying, 
Look, God's dwelling place is now among his people. Like there's this kind of idea of God is setting the table right now for a massive family reunion. And when the new heaven and the new earth comes, the fine china's all out. The dwelling places have been prepared. The new Jerusalem has been built. And we are all welcomed into the fullness of the presence of God. The labor pains of this present age have been worth it. Because it's been God honoring the process of including people into his family. Of including his people into making all things right again for this restoration of the way things were supposed to be in this new heaven and this new earth. So there's power, there's peace, and there's purpose in the promise of heaven. There's power, knowing how things are going to be, we know how they should be now. And we live into the power of the Holy Spirit, bringing that truth and wholeness and life and light to this broken world. There's peace, because we know even when things don't go how we know they should, a new day is coming. It is guaranteed, and there will be a time when all things are made right. And there's purpose as we prepare for that day, as we become who we've been created to be. And on that day, we're reunited with the living God. And with every other human heart who's trusted in him throughout history, we long for that day. Here's the bottom line. God gets what he wants. In the end, all things are made new. God gets what he wants. In Genesis, he dwelled with his people in the garden. And then there's this great human tragedy and drama of him redeeming all people to himself. And, and in Revelation, there's a garden city where all things are made right again. God gets what he wants with interest. It's at great cost to himself, right? He pays the penalty for our rebellion, but he gets what he wants, and the end is not the end. The end is just a new beginning. My kids and I have been listening to the Chronicles of Narnia series by C.S. Lewis. Anybody, anybody ever read that? Fantastic books. They're all fantasy, um, but C.S. Lewis wrote them in a way to help us wrap our hearts and minds around the truth of who God is and what he's up to. And then the end of his final book, he writes this. And for us, this is the end of all the stories, and we can most truly say that they lived happily ever after. But for them, the characters in the book, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now, at last, they were beginning chapter one of the greatest story, which no one on earth has ever read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. And then the audiobook was read that said they could barely believe that they had been alive before because of how alive they were now. That's the hope of heaven that we have. God gets what he wants, and the truest reality is still coming, the fullest life, the most vivid colors, the restoration of all that is broken. God gets what he wants. And friends, I just want to say explicitly today, God wants you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants you in his family. He wants you to hear his voice. To know that you're loved, to know that the shame and the brokenness and the doubt that is in your life can be put to rest because of His presence. God gets what He wants, and He wants you. Now, in this life, to live fully, to be redeemed, to live in your purpose and your power, but forever in His family and restoration. God wants you. And we, as followers of Jesus, all we've done is believe in our heart that He is Lord. And, and admit it with our mouth that God raised him up from the dead, that he is king, that he's conquered death, and we're in his family. If you've never done that, if you've never said, I'm in, I believe that God is God, that Jesus paid my debt, and I am giving my whole life to God, would today be the day? Would you say on February 3rd, 2019, that was close, but that's the day I crossed that line. I said, you know what, God, I don't have all the answers. I'm not really sure who you are in full, but I'm in. All you have to do is believe that in your heart and say it with your mouth, and you're in. And you can look forward to the fullness of life in this age and be a part of God's rescue plan for all of earth. And you can look forward to this hope of heaven that brings his power and his peace and purpose.
And I'd like to worship him at this time. And just pray for us. Jesus, thank you for the brokenness of this world. That wasn't good enough for you. That you loved your people. That you gave your life to reconcile all people to right relationship with you. We pray, Lord, as we move into our week, that you would continue to be loud in our lives. That you continue to show us the truth of heaven both here on earth and how we can participate in it and give us the hope of that world to come. We love you, we believe in you, we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand on this.